Hello, I'm Roberta Grossman, um, and I'm going to be moderating this conversation between these two wonderful filmmakers who are participating in Film Independence, a uh, program called Always Remember, um, films about the Holocaust. In this case, there are two films that these directors have made which touch on the subject of cross-cultural rescue. But before we talk about the films, let me introduce you to both of them. Uh, on the right, um, Sabina, if you can raise your hand. Um, Sabina was born in, in Bosnia, Herzegovina. Herzegovina, thank you. <laughs> Sabina Varasha, Varaka, uh, immigrated to the U.S. as a war refugee. I've, I think I've done all the mangling I'm going to do for right now. Um, she started her professional career in theater, writing, directing, and producing plays at the Lincoln Center and Shakespeare and Company. Sabina ventured into the world of film by directing and producing the critically acclaimed feature documentary, Back to Bosnia. The film premiered at the AFI Fest, screened at 30 festivals worldwide, and is featured in the top 100 of the greatest films directed by women by the BBC. It's currently streaming on multiple platforms, including Amazon. Since then, Sabina has written and directed a number of shorts, including the one that you have just seen. Um, and the shorts that she's made have won accolades such as a nomination for the Student Oscars, the Humanities Prize, and BAFTA Student Award, among others. Okay, Talia, thank you for bearing with me as I try to tell our audience about you. Talia Finkel is coming to us from um, Jerusalem this evening. Um, she says that she's a multidisciplinary artist who specializes in documentary cinema. And most of, and we'll talk about this in the discussion, but most of your work, um, as you express on your website, deals with, with borderlines of identity and of belonging. And you seek to use your personal experience as the primary basis of all that you create. And you say, interestingly, that every medium contains possibilities of documentation, photography, video, text, etc. Therefore, everything I go through in life may be rushes for my next film. The inner world is equivalent to the outer world and therefore merits documentation no less. Well, that's very um, philosophical. Um, yeah. So let's um, talk about your, both of your wonderful films. Um, and I'm, uh, you both have made films that are based on true stories. And in the case of Sabina, you chose uh, in your short to dramatize the story. And Talia, you chose to make a documentary, even though you use some techniques that may not be uh, thought of as purely documentary. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, starting with you, Sabina, why did you choose to make a dramatic short um, in order to tell this true story? So as you mentioned, my first film, uh, I was switching from theater to film, and the first one was a feature documentary. And um, uh, while that was quite a remarkable experience for me and, and very life changing. Um, I found that by the end of it, the end of the festival run that my the audience that I was reaching was very niche. It was the people who already knew um, or were, you know, curious about that war. And, um, and so since then, I've, I've primarily been making narrative uh, films, because I feel that in my experience, at least, it's a much wider audience. You can reach people who would not necessarily maybe want to watch a true documentary about World War II in Bosnia, but would want to watch, you know, a narrative drama with some thrilling elements that is set in that time. So that was my main motivation to reach as many people as possible. Well, that's a great answer. What about you, Talia? You made the opposite choice. You chose to take a true story and make it into a documentary or express it in a documentary. Well, my story is basically uh, my activism because I made another film about uh, Dr. Muhammad Helmi in uh, 2017. And uh, until then, nobody was willing to accept the, the word of righteous among the nations. And I made uh, research, which is, uh, I'm, I'm telling about it in, in the film, to find somebody from the family who will be willing to accept the award and actually to speak about the Holocaust. And he is the first, uh, Nas Dr. Nasser Kotbi is basically the first Arab ever spo speaking about the Holocaust in a film. So the film shows also what I did to, to get kind of a justice or end to the story that I started in uh, 2014 with my first film. So it's basically like, um, I would say, um, 
a life event for me to deal with Dr. Helmi's story and his courage. And uh, it, it's my, um, like, my, my ideas and, and my will to get it uh, to daylight. So, so the, this contemporary Wait. element and this element of autobiography or following your life as it unfolds, and in this case, your activism, um, that demands a documentary form because it's happening. It's on, it's it's a, you're following yourself in a verite fashion. I was the one like in this film. I'm the one with uh, moving this uh, snowball that that started. It started for me when I read about this uh, story in the newspaper, mm -hmm. but I started to roll this this ball and it became something very, very big. And, you know, if there is a film when I am not a part of and I have films that I'm not part of, so I don't need to take myself in. But since I'm, I am a, a player in, in this field, so I needed to to put myself then it's all um it's it's a, i would say um mix of a documentary about right now about documentary about the past about the times of the holocaust and what carla and nasser are doing together mm -hmm. so so like you chose a, in, in within this documentary form you chose you did choose to use some um recreation techs techniques and enhanced photographs um, and techniques where you cast an actors as Dr. Helmi and as Anna. Can you talk a little bit about that choice and if you have received any um, blowback or criticism about that from documentary purists? Um, so when, when I came to the story, I had like uh, maybe six photos of, of the people Mm -hmm. And um, most of like Helmi's photos were from the time when when he was much older than the time of of the story, mm -hmm. and of course no video, and also Anna I had like uh, two pictures of her as a as a child or a teenager, right? So I I didn't have much to work with, and I was thinking um, that it would be ideal for me to get like archive footage. And then I sat with my animation artist, Tiron Shin, and we developed this uh, technique that we film people that look, that are kind of close to the people from the pictures. Mm -hmm. They are dressed in uh, clothes outfits from the 40s. And uh, they are filmed in a green screen in a studio. But then they are uh, assembled in um, environments that are made from, from real archive from this, these times. And real footage of photos. So we got something which looks like an uh, archive in a way, but also have all the symbolistic options. And, um, you know, this um, uh, anime, like what, what anima it, it has like uh, what the animation can give you, like the symbolistic side and the metaphorical side. And you can also go with your imagination. So. I really love the the idea that it would be some somewhere between a very realistic, very much like archive, but on the other hand, it can give me whatever I need in film, like dramatic. Well, There's a sort of a, a orange patina over a lot of those uh, shots. Oh, how did you achieve that? Is that animation? I don't I don't know this okay. Uh, term. Okay, all right, fine. Um, uh, no, but maybe you can explain it. What is orange? in your in those scenes that you just described how you shot with green screen and archival? A lot of them are like orange or brown, brown, brown. Yeah. So it, I just wonder how you is that just color correction or was there some painting involved? Uh, in that, it is, it is some painting, it, it's called the rotoscoping. So you take uh, like the real uh, footage and you put it through many filters. And you put you put everything in environment. So of course everything needs to to look the same. And we thought about uh, sepia, for example, like right. uh, photos that you have from that period. So that what they actually at the end gave the the final look because we wanted it to be to look like archive. Right. So this right. is how archive looks like. Right. Okay. I think that I think it was very successful. Um, yeah. Sabina, is it important to you um, 
to know that when, do you think that for your viewers that it's important for them to know as they're watching, does it add to the gravitas of the film to know that they're watching a real story? Yes, very much so. I mean, I, I put on a, it, it, there's something about the short film, first of all, because it was a, sh you know, it's such an enormous story and I had to squeeze it all in, you know, 16, 17 minutes and then credits. Right. And so, um, so there's a lot of um, creative freedom that I took in terms of dialogue and, you know, there are certain, you know, all the, all the characters with the exception of the, uh, the Ustasha Ustash soldier, the Ivica character who stops them and kind of has a personal connection to her. Everyone actually what did exist and that really, and, and the events that happened did happen, but I had to dramatize a lot of it. And so because of that, I put it, it was inspired by a true story, but it really is, you know, as true of a story as I could put in that um, setting. And I am turning it into a feature. I just completed the first draft of the feature script, which is, you know, in that regard, follows the story much closer because I have much more freedom in which I can. Um, can you talk a little bit about what you had to leave out um, of the short that you hope that the feature will reveal? Yeah, I mean, um, for the biggest thing that I had to leave out was really what Rivka and her family had to do in order to save uh, Zainaba and her family during the Bosnian War in the 90s, um, because right now we just kind of see that, you know, they sent the um, JDC to um, rescue her, which is really what happened. But it was a pretty complicated political maneuvering, um, which I was extremely impressed with. I mean, in both of these women's cases, they're not they're ordinary people. There are people like you and me that I don't have any like if I had to do something like that, I don't know anyone that I could possibly off the top of my head, I could call who would have such a political influence to actually change something. You know, my friends are, you know, connected in a certain way, but not in that way. And so, and it was a case for both of them too, you know what I mean? And so for, you know, in, in case of uh, Kabilos, they actually got as far as the prime minister, Itzhak Rabin, who urged with the Muslim authorities in Bosnia to release, to help expedite and save uh, Hadaga, Zainba Hadaga and her daughter and, and, and daughter's family, which to me, when I found that out, I was like, how? Like, how did they? And then started researching and and reading and and reading testimonies and, and documentaries, footage and all this stuff. And I was like, wow, this is really, I don't know, to me, that part is something that um, is really important because I feel like we all feel very powerless in times like that, we just think, well, who am I? What could I possibly do? But it shows that if you put your mind to it, and if you're really stubborn, and, and you'll find a way if it really, really is something that you wholeheartedly believe in. And so that's one of the things. And then, of course, there was a lot of, um, like Yosef in World War II, you know, after she saves them, then Yosef decides to stand, stay behind, and then he gets recaptured by the Gestapo, and there's a whole other very complicated rescue of how to save his life, and um, you know, a lot of a lot of things like that. That I hope to expand in, in the future. In feature. So, Sabina, this does this story, from what I understand of your biography, has some personal resonance for you. Um, can you talk about your entry point into this story? And then tell you, I'll ask you the same about your, your film as well. But starting with Sabina, what was your personal entry point into this story? Did you set out to make a film about Bosnia and why? Um, well, a couple of things. Um, I come from a family of rescuers, I guess, um, or, or wannabe rescuers. I mean, the, the initial story of Muslims saving Jews in World War II Bosnia, I heard from my grandmother, and um, she was a, a nine-year-old girl when World War II was happening. And um, towards the end of her life, she told me a story that I didn't really know. Nobody ever talked about it when I was a kid in Bosnia. Um, she, her best friend was Jewish, and she didn't even really know. I mean, they, we, everybody was just sort of living together and, and in the same neighborhood. It was just her next-door neighbor. And um, when they were both about nine years old, um, World War II started, and Ustasha, the, the Croatian Nazis, came and um, took her family, the, the friend's family away. And my grandmother remembered, you know, in her, you know, 80s, the story, she said, you know, it's the one thing that has haunted me all these years is that we did nothing to, she's like, I, I cried and I asked my parents to intervene, but everybody was too scared and no one did anything. And we didn't really know where they were taking them. And it wasn't until, you know, years later that we found out they were killed in a concentration camp. And she said, you know, and I think I thought about that when 50 years later, 
they came for us, you know, than when the Muslims were on the lists. And so she said, you know, she was a very uh, religious woman. And she said, you know, I really do believe that like it happened to us because we didn't do it mu as much. Like we should have done something. And she was really like, that was the one regret that she had in her life. And, um, and you know, of course I told her you couldn't have done anything. You were a little girl, you know, all that stuff. And so, um, so, but that story, you know, she passed away in, in 2015 and that story really stayed with me um, since then. And um and then my father really risked his life to save a lot of people during the Bosnian War and and really, you know, put everything on a line. And I did know, you know, that's my documentaries about that. And so when I set out to, I wanted to tell a story really about this cross-cultural, cross-religious um, friendship and collaboration and, and helping save one another. And it was really remarkable. And I, so I researched all the stories of the Muslim saving Jews in World War II Bosnia. But then when I came across this particular story, I just loved it because it was in some way my grandmother sent it. You know, it's like two friends, it was the same situation. They were just much older so that you know, Zainaba could actually do something about it. And so even when I was writing, because, you know, I don't know, I could really, Zainaba has passed away and there was no one really who could tell me what she was like. Everybody who knew her back in her 20s is dead. And so I just imagined my grandmother. So a lot of, you know, how that character behaves and what she says and, you know, it was very much in, you know, my way of giving that way of possibly acting to my grandmother so she can kind of live vicariously through that story, something that she couldn't really do in real life. So that's a form of honoring your grandmother. And Taya, I assume that that the films that you've made, not one, but two films that you've made um, about the doctor, the Egyptian doctor, is a form of you of honoring him as well. What compelled you to tell his story, an honest story? So when I, um, when I found this uh, sentence, uh, he who saves one life that saves the entire world. Uh, this is a sentence that uh, I am, as a, as a vegan activist, as somebody who is uh, really fighting for animal rights, I say it all the time to, to everyone who wants to hear me. And when I heard this story, and uh, actually I lived several years in Vienna before, before I made this film, and in Vienna, like like Jews and like Israelis and Palestinians, we were like on the same boat. Let's say we were foreign, foreigns. And when I came back to Israel and I heard this uh, story and I saw lots of uh, racism on the net or on the net against Arabs, and I thought this is the ultimate story about somebody who put his life and put humanity first and did the really right thing in the most horrible day in, in the human history. Like, I don't know, maybe there are not so, so many, I think, other events which are so awful as the Holocaust. And if this this man, he chose to put everything aside and he said, this is the one thing that I can do for somebody else. I can't change the world, but I can do something for one person and I can do something to save one life. And and this is um, this is a sentence that I really relate to. And I, I live um, in the light of this sentence for many years since I'm... A vegan, basically, but even a bit before when I was vegetarian. Um, so, so I feel that like he did it for for a human being. You can do it for everybody in your surroundings. And since he didn't get the honor and and uh, like the um, um, like all the recognition from the people. And I think that everybody in the world should know about it. And in every conflict, people should think about it first and think about humanity, not about politics, not about war, not about revenge. And they should do something for somebody else. And I think this what would make the world a much better place. So this is, I, I feel, right. my, my, my place as, as, a, as a filmmaker, as somebody who can bring a story and bring it to the light and bring it to the conscious of people and of audience, uh, which this film is uh, is meeting many, many audience. Also the the last film is actually, uh, was uh, bought by um, the German um, uh, Ministry of Education. 
and it is uh, being uh, shown in uh, one one uh, one hundred twenty thousand uh, high schools all over Germany. So many people know the story of Dr. Helmi. That's so fantastic. That's really so, fantastic. So this is what what I believe, and I believe that films can make some kind of social change and some change in, in humans' um, minds, in a way. I was very struck um, that, you know, the idea of if you save one person, it's as if you saved the whole world. Um, the, the, the nephew, the, the doctor who you meet and go to Berlin with, he says that, and he says it's from the Quran. It's also in the Jewish Bible or the, you mm -hmm. know, the Jewish writings. So I was very struck by that. Um, and Talia, I wanted to ask you, I'm sure you started your film way, way, way before October 7th, but I'm wondering how these events, um, which are so polarizing, have impacted the way you look at the story, the way you look at the film, the way that audiences are receiving it. So I made it, um, I think, like a year and a half before, um, before uh, October 7th. And I actually, um, four, four months ago, I went with Nasser to a premiere in Vienna. So he flew from, from Egypt, I flew from Israel, and we had Carla on the Zoom. <laughs> And uh, like both of us, an Egyptian and an Israeli on the same stage. And, you know, we, we, we thought about it and we thought, you know, that if uh, like, you know, Jews in a way forgave the Germans for the Holocaust and the Americans and the Vietnamese made some kind of a peace. So I really hope that, you know, if you if you take away everything, something can be maybe solved in a way because you know I, you can't really get into like all the situation is so complicated and like i feel like i'm i was actually volunteering with with people from from the nova festivals and i have like uh, horrible nightmares about what happened and i'm very much afraid to go on the streets in Jerusalem, which is a mixed city. Uh, but I really want to believe in the heart of, of in some kind of goodness, which I think is, uh, um, I think it's something that, that everybody who is not a part of a terrorist organization wants to, to live a good life. And I think, you know, that I can take this story, like my story about Elmi and the courage of Nasser to come to to build this uh, bridge with me, with, mm -hmm. with, you know, with like Israelis. And like, uh, like I approached him and he approached me and, you know, everything. So I think if some good people will gather, I think everything can be solved and everything can be settled. And of course, there is like, there are a lot of, like horrible stuff that were done uh, to us, to to Israelis, and also bad stuff that were done to the Palestinians during the the years. And you know, it's not my fault. <laughs> it's it's not somebody like in my age fault anyway. But uh, there there is not so much we can do about the past. We can basically do things about the future and about how how we handle now and hopefully not revenging and trying to find ways for uh, for peace and to see the other person on the other side. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, so, um, Sabina, uh, you've been very prolific and very active, and I'm wondering, you said you're working on a, a writing a script on the feature. Is there something, anything else that you want to tell us that you're working on now? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't just tell stories about World War II and Muslim-Jewish friendships. Um, it is something that after making this short film, I've become much more um, curious about and interested in, and it's something I just keep exploring in my future ideas. Um, but I'm also, I have a, a feature film that is set in a Bosnian community in Florida that is a contemporary story. And it's really about, I'm I, I'm a generation of refugees who came to America as kids, as was my brother. And it's something that's really, uh, 
interesting to me because there's not many films that are really or even stories really that explore that you know you kind of always see it from the maybe the first generation you know somebody whose parents came and they're the ones who are trying to find their identity but I find that all of us were deeply um up we were uprooted and are yet to find our footing in a way, you know, even though we're fully Americanized and have this, you know, and so it's just an exploration of that through a very, um, through a crime thriller. I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of, of genre. And so I'm sort of decided to explore it through that again, and sort of in the same uh, vein, as I was saying earlier, is I'm, I'm really interested in re reaching the widest audience possible and, exp and exposing people who wouldn't necessarily be interested in subject matters that are so dear to me and that I feel like, um, to Talia's point, are really important for us to put out in a world because it is our job as storytellers to tell stories that can change people's minds and therefore change their approach to the world, you know? Um, and so, but, you know, because of my love of genre and me being in Hollywood, you know, it's kind of, I want to also tap into the audiences who would just want to have watch a popcorn film right you know and and still be affected by it so that's that's what my main focus is now it's called for buddhas and um and it does you know it does touch upon talking talia talking about like peace in younger generations you know bosnian war was really brutal it was horrible and most of that of the people who live through it have a really hard time forgiving either side and you know and yet there's this generation that were either you know really young when it happened and were very shielded from it or were born after and do not understand that hatred and animosity that still is prevalent in um especially in the diaspora and mm -hmm. so it's something that i'm i'm very much tuning into and trying to expose in this as well thank you and talia what about you what are you working on um I'm actually now developing a, a fiction film, uh, which is kind of a comedy, and it's called Your Mission. And I actually, I wanted to say that if, the, because there is not live audience here, so I am very much open to hear what people think about this film that you saw. And I have a website, it's taliafinkel.com, or I have a Facebook. So if anyone of you wants to reach me or write to me or tell me what you think, I will be very happy to hear. And about uh, this film, Anna and the Egyptian Doctor, actually Nasser uh, wrote a book about his memories with uh, Dr. Helmi. And I was thinking to um, publish this book in like an album with documents, with uh, pictures from the production, from the film, and to translate it to several languages. So this is something that I would like to, to work. And also you can find about it in my website um, if you want. And I just finished the um, second season of a web series. It's called the Freedom Farm Sanctuary. It's about, You can find it also in the YouTube. And now it's starting in uh, film festivals. Uh, it's about animals that were uh, rescued from the food industry and are... Um, uh, they have like challenges like volunteers that are taking care of them. So this is something that the first uh, the first um, uh, the first one won uh, many awards, also the best documentary in uh, in Israel in the documentary forum and the uh, six awards worldwide. And now it's the second season, which is finished like a month ago. <laughs> so, uh, well, so you're very busy. I, I'm in between many things. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, um, I think that is it um, for us. We've we've managed to do about half an hour and keep it at that. And um, it's a pleasure to speak to you both. And it was a, a pleasure to watch both of your films. I learned a lot and I was very moved by them, by the humanity in them, both uh, the humanity of the stories themselves and the humanity of you two as directors and telling those stories in a sensitive way. Uh, and I wish you both the best of luck in your future careers. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you.